Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, today's webinar will be talking about, well, actually showing you uh, machining on uh, AeroFrame part using the iMachining 3D as well as uh, HSM and simultaneous five axis uh, machining. Uh, and for a demonstration like this, uh, I can't think of anyone better to show it to you uh, than Amod Ankor, who will be doing the webinar itself. He's our product manager for HSR, HSM, and multi axis simultaneous machining. And uh, let me just make one more point. I listened to this webinar yesterday uh, when he was giving it to the customers. And I can tell you right now, there are a lot of interesting and practical uh, tips that he will be talking about as he's showing the webinar. So uh, pay good attention to it. It will help you out in the future. And uh, Amod, I will make you the presenter now. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, all friends watching this webinar today. Uh, today, uh, our webinar is going to be about this particular part that you are seeing on the screen. Okay, Amod, please share your screen. I think I did. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Right, so uh, this is the part that uh, we are talking, uh, I'm going to talk about today, uh, and rather I'm going to show you this part, and uh, this part is basically a portion of an arrow frame. We're not allowed to show everything, so what we have done is uh, I have made a similar part, designed a similar part in SolidWorks, and then uh, we will see the machining of this part using some technologies inside SolidCAD. Many of my customers are in aerospace because that's, that's a big domain that we uh, sell uh, SolidCAD into. And uh, I have got some tips from the people working there on how to machine such parts. Now, this is actually a pretty small portion when you consider the the aero frames that can run into several meters, big, yeah, large parts, several pockets. Okay, so the first important thing here is holding of this aero frame part. You can see there are eight lugs that have been defined or designed around the side, the periphery of this part. And these lugs are actually going to be an integral part of the part. And these lugs are going to be bolted down to the fixture. So the stock also has similar holes. So exactly at these places, it will be bolted okay, to the holding fixture or fixture plate below. OK, so uh, this being the uh, design side, uh, from the machining uh, perspective, there are several things that uh, we need to take care of. First of all, ensure that your holding is perfectly flat on, on the fixture plate. You don't have variations on the bottom surface because if you have variations on the bottom surface, you will have an arc kind of warping immediately that will start coming up. Like an, it starts behaving like an arc. So the holding is very important. The bottom face of the sock should be perfectly flat. Right. Once we have ensured the lugs are OK, bottom face is done, it's mounted on the fixture, on the machine, we now go into our machining. Now, today I'm using the uh, development version of uh, 
Solid Cam 2016. And at one point, it is actually going to crash. So let me forewarn you that we'll have one crash. And uh, we're trying to see where from which build that has come out from. And that will be fixed. You don't have to worry about it. So we will move and come back again. So that will be a few seconds this, uh, disturbance in between. OK. So let's start new milling. OK, external. All right, we're going to use a Hermley C30. And for our, I'm just going to hide the sketches. For our coordinate system, I will pick up the topmost point. Yeah, that's good enough for us. Accept this. I'm not going to define the stock because we are going to do it outside later on. However, I'm going to define the machine. It's a Hamlet C30. And in the material database, I'm going to use an AL6061, the aerospace grade aluminium, with uh, 450 megapascals as uh, the ultimate tensile strength. OK. Once that is done, I will now switch on my stock. Let's define it. And this is the 3D model. OK. Stock work is over. Let's switch on the fixture holding plate and define the target. OK, target is also defined. Now let's set this up on our machine. So I will use the machine setup and define the fixture. OK, the fixture is the bottom plate. And I would like to lift this up by 125 millimeters above that so that we have a nice view of the machine. Now, in 2016, if you will, you obviously see this at the uh, next webinars when they come up for what's new. There's a new thing called as a machine preview that allows you to check your part setup on the machine even before you go for the next step of uh, making the programs. So what you have here is the only machine, and you can see the stock that's already defined out here. Now what we can check in this, in my case, I would like to check what happens when the C-axis rotates. Okay, So I would like to check what happens. You can see that we are going to have a major foul between the stock and the bed. So obviously I would need some correction. I will need to put a radius out here, here. So I can always go back, say OK, edit this part, sorry, and switch on stock. So what we can do now is we can insert features fillet, and we can fill it out all the four areas for about, let's say, uh, 60 millimeters. OK, that's done. Let's switch off the stock, come out of the part, and go into the setup again. Sorry, we need to check if the stock has been updated. Let's select, reselect it. OK, let's edit the setup go into our machine simulation again, and you can see that my stock inside has been updated. Let's rotate it again to see if we're going to have a foul. And we are good to go because there is not much of a uh, fouling that's 
actually a clearance out here. So machine simulation in, in case of milling uh, can be very useful in setting up part, checking if there are uh, fouls that are happening with the part and so on. For Milton, it's even more crucial to see how the tool orientation is and stuff like that. So the machine uh, visualization is uh, more effective than Milton, but it's also effective in five axis because it allows you to check your part even before you go into machine. All right, now that our setup is okay, let's switch off the stock and also the holding fixture. And let's concentrate on a part. Okay. So the first mistake what we do when we are machining uh, using uh, or when you are machining the part in uh, solid cam is we apply eye machining straight away to everything. If you remember or if you look at the walls out here, it's hardly two millimeter. So your your ribs are about two millimeter thick, two to three millimeters in some areas, but they are very thin. So if you try to do eye machining completely in one go, what is going to happen is it will first scoop the material and then try to do a step up. Imagine that it has scooped out the material on this and this, and now it's trying to do a step up on this thin wall out here. It can be catastrophic because your wall will start vibrating. It will start moving from one side to the other. And in many cases, you can just damage the wall. It can just tear off. So it's very important that you first finish, rough and finish the walls. Okay, this we have learned after a very hard in a very hard way. After damaging few parts, we learned this. So let's start with our first operation. And this is not going to be eye machining, which is going to be a 3D HSR. What I've done is to make the things more easier, I've saved templates. So I'm going to add the first HSR operation. OK. Tool is a 12 ball nose. Constraint boundary in this case is actually going to be defined by the color. So I have also defined colors for the ribs. Okay. Generally, it's also a nomenclature in, uh, in, in aerospace that there are colors for different uh, features of the part. So ribs have one color. So I'm going to pick the color from the model and I'll find the faces. Okay. Those are the faces. And we are now going to define our boundary for this particular group of faces. I've kept a slight offset of two millimeters so that we don't just cut the rip, but also cuts a bit of the side to relieve it for finishing. In the process, not much. Down step one millimeter, offset of 0.5. And Z bottom is on this face. It's minus 11.5. Link and other things are being taken directly from the uh, Template, let's calculate quickly because it's a pretty fast calculation. Doesn't take much time. Okay. Roughing is done, so if you run the simulation, this is how it would look. That's the part. And that's how our roughing would look like. We just roughed out the ribs area. And we'll also now finish the ribs. Again, I have a template. Uh, this is a constant, oops, not HSR, sorry. It's a wrong template. Let's add a template, HSM. <coughs> It's a constant step over, three really constant step over. We'll use the same boundary for drive as well as the constraint. Passes. Since it's just a demo, let's make it at 0.5 and let's hit save and calculate. This is also going to be pretty quick. Okay. 
toolpath was done. That's how my toolpath would look like. Okay, so we have dropped out and finished the ribs. So now we are not going to touch the ribs at all. Now we have done this because it has to be done even before you start roughing because then you have solid material. You don't have any vibrations. It's very smooth. So now we can start off with our eye machining. So let me add a split after and I'll say I'm machining rough. Okay, again here also have created templates, but there's a difference. In aerospace machining to control warping, one of the re one of the things that I told you was the holding. We have ensured that the holding is good. The other thing is the machining itself. When you try to rough out in so many number of pockets on a large frame. If you rough out everything in one go, you will induce stresses. You will induce stresses for uh, during machining and that will induce warping. What generally the aerospace programmers do is they don't completely machine this in one go. They machine this pocket, they leave this next pocket, they machine the third pocket, leave the fourth, machine the fifth, leave the sixth, and machine the seventh, and so on. They keep alternating between each pocket. They keep leaving uh, material in between so that stresses are induced in a in, in much lesser way and the warping also is controlled. Right? And this is exactly what we are going to do today. We are going to machine alternatively. So I'm going to add uh, operations from a template, I machining 3D, okay, target, and we are going to define working area. Okay, that's very uh, crucial here because we need to define one by one or alternate. So for that, I have already created some sketches, and we are going to use the sketches for our uh, definition. Okay, that's right. So the first sketch. Yes. Second sketch done. I don't want to show the chain on the work plane. The third sketch. Yes. And the fourth one. Okay, the fourth one has some small elements which I need to pick up. Yep, that should be good enough. So we have got four pockets out here, and I will Accept this. Okay. The tool is a 16 corner radius 3 pull nose tool. And my Z level is here. Technology wizard, I'm cutting at level 6. However, the scallop I'm going to define is going to be about 1 millimeter. Toolpath tolerance is about 0.1, that's good enough. The max arc size is set to 8, half of the tool diameter, that's also fine. I'm going to save this. I will not calculate it now. And now I will add the second operation of my machining, which is once we have finished 4, it takes care of machining the other area. So next time machining 3D. Obviously this won't have any working area, so it's left out. Tool is the same, lower level, in this case it's right up to minus 50. Technology wizard, you're not changing anything. Scallop, again one millimeter. Okay. Let's save this. And let's add, once we have done with the eye machining, there obviously is going to be some material left out. For that, we need to do some rest roughing. For rest roughing, I choose to use an HSR operation, so I'm going to add an HSR operation. That was the HSR operation. Okay. It's a 12 bull nose with corner radius 3. Not much of things to explain here because they're all pretty much self-explanatory. So let's save this. Okay. Now, my, goal, my idea is to use this three process, put them in parallel calculation, and then go ahead with our most important aspect of explaining 
the uh, swarming. However, we I did notice yesterday during my webinar that there was a bug, or maybe that's a development version. But maybe we can do a thing. If we try with the first two and put them in parallel. Okay. Okay. So this is what I was talking about. That's nothing to worry because it's a development version. I'm going to uh, go to the process and end it straight away. Okay. Let's start. This is the interruption that I talked about. Now it's going to be fine. We will reload back the part and solid cam and it should be fine. Uh, I want to put it in parallel uh, because of one reason, uh, because that calculation takes about five to seven minutes. And you just don't want me to be looking at the screen to uh, wait for the calculation to finish. We can finish our other important things. So what I'm going to do is to put those three operations in the background for calculations, and we continue ahead with our swarfing. Okay. Okay, those things are ready. Let's switch off our sketch. Let's pick three and put it into parallel. Okay. Right, so that's the magic. It's now working fine. Okay, so I'm now going to add Swarf. Now, before I add Swarf, what I've done here is you can see that I have colored uh, some of these surfaces in brown color, right? Can you see that? They have been colored brown. Now, these are colored in a different color because if I do a, a draft angle analysis, okay? So let's edit this uh, part and evaluate. If I do a draft angle analysis, you will realize that these surfaces are having negative draft. So it's obvious that if we have done a three-axis roughing, we are going to get a straight wall, and there's going to be a lot of material remaining out there. So these areas cannot be directly finished using a single-line swarfing toolpath, but we need to do some kind of a rest roughing. Okay, I call it rest roughing and swarfing uh, on these areas. Okay, so let's take one pocket because it's going to be the same for all of the pockets. You can later on, when you have the complete file with you, you can attack it. So I'm going to take this pocket in the center and let's see how we do this rest roughing in Swarf. So let me add the Swarf operation. <coughs> Geometry, my Swarfing surface. Now, the selection here is important. We have one. Some calculation running. Let's make it more. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. I'm not selecting this fillet. I'll explain you why. I'm not going to select the fillet. So these are the surfaces. Floor will be defined by this, this, and the fillets. That's my floor. And this one. Okay. So there are nine surfaces. I'd like to keep 0.5 millimeter offset on the swarf faces and about 0.3. And the tool that I'm going to use here is uh, let me import the tool because I've also saved the tools. Even they are duplicate, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we're going to use a 12 bull nose, a 55 millimeter outer folder. Right, <clears throat> so we have this tool. Let's put some values of entry and exit distance. Uh, basically, that is it, but because this is 47 millimeters and the tool only has 35 millimeter cut length, I need to have two passes and not a single pass, so it will divide it into maybe 22, 22 millimeter and put the pass. Let's calculate. Okay, 
So this is how my Swarf toolpath looks like. Uh, let me change the color. This one, let's make it yellow. Okay. okay we can see that one of our eye machining toolpaths has been calculated. Okay, this is how my uh, uh, toolpath looks like. Now you can see that it's machined almost everything, but what we wanted to uh, see was machining maybe from some portion of this face and going right up to here with some portion of this face. How is this to be done? Without splitting any of the geometry, this can be easily done. So I have to swarf itself. So you've got an option out here called as extension start and end. Okay, extensions can be positive, they can also be negative. So I'm going to give minus 200 and minus 50, okay, and calculate, yes please. You can see what happened here was it moved the start point straight away much before this, so there will be a slight overlap into this surface and also some small overlap into this surface out here. This is what we want, but we need some entry and exit uh, links, so we will use the lead in and lead out with uh, a height of one millimeter and with a height of one millimeter here. Okay, let's save and calculate. Okay, so we have got entry and exit. However, for one of the toolpaths we did not get. That's because entry and exits for such events need to be defined in two ways. One outside and one inside. Okay. Okay, one here again. That's okay. Save and calculate. Okay, that's done. So you've got a nice entry and exit for both of the toolpaths. All now we need to do is to provide multiple passes. That's pretty simple again. Let's go roughing and more. And so I've got five passes. And each pass radial depth of cut is one and a half millimeter. And that looks pretty nice. Okay. Of course, again, we need to put some leads and links and that can be done in here in the same environment. Okay, calculate. So we have got nice entry and exits and multiple passes to make sure that the material is not removed in one go but in more than one pass. Fair enough. Once we are out of this, now we know that we have removed the material. We can now add another swarfing toolpath to finish the uh, surfaces. Since the earlier swarf uh, was not having one of the surfaces, so we need to reselect the new set of surfaces. The uh, floor is already done, so I just need to pick from our drop down menu. We're going to use a 12 bonus for finishing this. Okay. Surface normal. And in roughing and more, I would like to have two. And in our link, I'd like to give lead in and lead out. Okay, one millimeter. Lead out also is one millimeter. And inside, we have to provide one millimeter out here. Okay, let's save and calculate. Okay. So that's pretty nice. You've got a toolpath that's cutting across all the areas pretty nicely. Right. So we have finished the wall. Now we need to tackle the fillet and the floor. Unfortunately, SWARF does not give you the solution. 
So we have to go fall back on our generic 5-axis, which we're going to do now. So for fillets, I'm going to use a generic 5-axis machining. So sim 5x, and we will use our regular morph between two boundary curves. The drive surface in this case, by the way, if you have noticed, you have seen that all my calculations are done. So that parallel calculations are very useful. It allows you to put those things in background and continue with your work. OK, these are our surfaces. The start end is this one, OK, and the last curve. So that's the first curve. It will show it on the work plane. And the next curve is the bottom curve. OK, that's done. And we're going to use a different tool here. We will use a 16 taper ball nose, something like this with a tip diameter of 4, so corner radius of 2, and my fillet corner radius is 2.5, so I can easily use it. Right. Our tool axis control, however, is going to be through a curve, because you know this can't be done without any curve, so I'm going to switch on my sketch again. Of course, that sketch is off, so I'll go into my history and switch on the sketch. This is the sketch that I'm going to use. So I'll pick this. OK, that's done. We don't need the sketch, so I'll switch it off. And it's going to be from the closest point. Perfect. Let's hit Save and Calculate. And let's run, first of all, see what's happening. Simulation. OK, looks fine. Also looks fine. This looks great. OK. It's done pretty neatly. Right, so you can notice that my tool is passing through the curve and it is cutting the fillet out here. So my fillet can be finished this way using the uh, curve. Let's hide this. Now what we need to do is to finish the bottom, the floor, but Remember that the floor is flat, so you don't have to finish it completely. You have to finish it only to an extent that the tool is out of the uh, undercut. So again, I'm going to use a generic 5-axis machining. So same 5x. And here I'm going to use a parallel to curve function. Let's go to the geometry. The drive surface is this. And in the edge curve, I'm going to use to 1, and it's going to be by number of cuts, and it's 35. This tool is going to be the same. OK. And two path parameters, 0.5, spiral. OK. Perfect. Let's save and calculate. Simple toolpath. Right. So we have a toolpath, not machining completely, because this area that is remaining can be done using our regular HSM because it's a three-axis uh, tool. So let's simulate this. OK. Let's see what happens when it goes into the uh, corner, you can see that it's cutting through. It's obvious because we have not provided any calc check to it. Good. So what I'm going to do now is switch on the calc check for this surface. And we'll use a new type of calc check. Let's pick the uh, 
swarfing surfaces, and a set till tool, and a new function for automatic. Okay? You can see what automatic would do is it would apply both lead lag and fight tilt, but also a combination of both in areas where it needs to apply. So it takes care or it handles the, uh, the tilting all by itself. You can see that as it comes closer, it will start tilting itself. Okay, let's go to the side view so it's even more visible. You can see that it has already started tilting itself. Tilting, tilting. So it starts or it creates a pretty nice gout check area and applies both the side tilt, especially in the combination out here where it has to apply both side tilt and lead lag. So the automatic works very well now and you can use it in many places where you're not sure what kind of a, what kind of gout check you're supposed to use when you're tilting the tool. Okay? So uh, using this we are done with our uh, floor finishing. Now we will also quickly run the uh, outer swarfing. So I would like to swarf the outer surface to finish it. So my geometry is going to be one, two surfaces. You can see that we also have some bits and pieces here. Okay. That's it, and this one. Okay. And a tool that we're going to use is again the 12 bull nose. Right. Surface normal. All right, let's save and calculate. You can see that it has done the tool path. Uh, let's go to the rooftops, but it's much more visible. You can see the. But we need to avoid the lugs because the lugs are still there, and we don't want to cut off the lugs till we don't finish the entire part. So we'll provide a gout check against the check surfaces, and check surfaces in this case are these lugs. Of course, I could have given another color. It could have been made very easy to select. I forgot. It's a good reminder that our next webinars, the color definition has to be right so that the selection process can be made even more simple. Okay, but this won't take more than a minute at the most. But I can understand sometimes if you have to select 50, 60 faces, it's really painful. Okay, that's it. This is the last one. 32 faces because there are 8 lugs, 4 per lug. And let's calculate. Okay, you can see that it's retracted, come down again, and cut. You can, of course, uh, provide with uh, a leads and links. So could go into the link and between the slices you could allow for I don't know if it's between the slice or away from the slice. Let's check. No, it's not between the slice, sorry. It's the gap. Pretty much. Let's calculate. Okay. You can see that Swarf is pretty smart, that it doesn't allow a link to come on the side, but it keeps the link on the side and then enters the part. So it's pretty smart. It avoids gouging into the part, right? So what remains now is 
to cut off those lugs, these lugs, and for that again we are going to use a swarfing toolpath. However, we're going to cut, I'll show you the cutoff from on this lug. For that, what I have done is let me switch off the part. Uh, I'm going to switch off and I'm going to switch on two sets of surfaces. And let's add a swarf toolpath. Again, I'm going to use uh, this as our swarfing geometry. The tool that I'm going to use is a 12 bull nose, a short bull nose. Not this one. Yeah, this one. Short bull nose. Okay. Surface normal. Let's save and calculate. Okay, great. So let's show the part now so that it's easier now for us to visualize what's happening. So single pass, again you can see it's cutting from here and going all the way here. We will reduce the travel so that it doesn't unnecessarily go into the area by providing a negative extension. Okay, calculate, let's fix this first. Okay, this is nice. Now let's provide some multiple passes. So I'm going to give 10 passes, calculate, that's it. So you can see that use the swarf and just cut out the lug, right? Looks nice. You can, of course, uh, beautify this tool path, what they call it, by providing with uh, leads and uh, links. Let's add lead in and lead out and lead in and lead out. Let's calculate. Looks nice now. Yeah. So it's cut out. And how is this done? Basically, when they're cutting off the lugs, when the part is done, they put soft clamps on three or four, play, four places. They put soft clamps and machine the lugs out. The screws are removed and then the lugs are just smoothly shaved out from the part. And then the part comes out, it's ready to move on to the further process. Right, so let's run the simulation now that we have so much, so many toolpaths because we did not see our eye machining toolpaths. And this is how our eye machining toolpath would look like the first one. It will machine the four pockets, it will lead four. So that will induce less stress into the part. And then the remaining one will then get chopped out using the other eye machining toolpath. So let's run the simulation. Okay, solid verify. Let's zoom. Let's start. That's the eye machining toolpath that you're seeing now on your screen. Let's run again. some material left out and that's because of the holder.
So it's coming pretty close to the wall. Okay, that's the rest rough. Stop only for this current operation to see if we have furthermore crashes. Okay, that's the swarf, and then you have the uh, fillet, and then you have I can see how it, how it overcomes the lugs by jumping. Yeah. So, what we have seen, uh, by the way, in the last toolbar out here, okay, I could not show it, but I would definitely like to explain this. Where the tool came here in the simulation, we saw that the tool was trying to align with some other vector, okay, that was a bit crazy vector. Now, <clears throat> this can happen when you have got large paths. And the solution here is actually to use a, a different method in swarfing. Of course, nothing to do with the technology. But when you're selecting the surface, make sure your custom triangulation is set on. And you use about pretty tight uh, values for custom triangulation. Two microns for triangulation tolerance and a max edge length of 0.5. And reselect. Once you have selected this area, Go back to the geometry and reselect the surfaces. Okay, that way you avoid all these issues of tool trying to tilt in, in some crazy fashion uh, when it's doing swarfing. Okay, so, so you have to use custom triangulation if you if you found that you have that issue with the uh, uh, crazy tilts that are happening on the uh, on the on the side surface. Right. So pretty much in one part we saw. HSR, HSM, uh, eye machining 3D, swarfing, and our generic 5-axis engine along with some CAD work. Uh, this part, of course, will be available. I'm going to upload the finished part with the custom triangulation toolpath uh, by today evening, and it will be available to you on, on the uh, reseller area. You can download it and use it for your demos when you want to show Sim5x generic as well as for Swarm. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm open for questions now. Okay, Amo, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I don't see any questions. But uh, like you said, the uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded. And uh, the recording will be available. And later on, also, the uh, uh, part will be made available to you. So you can always go over the recording. Uh, look over on the part itself exactly what was done. Um, and uh, all I have to say from the question areas to you, Amod, is that you did a great job. And, of course, I would like to wish Amod a happy, happy birthday. It's his birthday today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sydney, and thank you, everyone. All right. Take care, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.